Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, before we get started, any questions on anything so far? Any material, any project related questions? No, pretty easy, pretty straightforward right now. We're all seeing the process. All right. Well, if you do, certainly reach out. Um, over the next couple of weeks, so this tonight is your outline is due, and then next week your sources will be due. And we talked a lot last week about sources and where to get them and what's credible, what's not credible, and really looking hard at what is something that you can actually use in your, your assignment. This week, we're gonna go a little bit further. We're gonna talk about research and some of the areas that we can actually get research. Uh, like I said, you'll need four sources for your final. Uh, you know what, I'm gonna change this right here, right now, because I think I said last time, and I, I kind of wanted to, uh, really stick and be consistent here. One of them is peer reviewed. And again, we've talked about what peer reviewed is and there's a pretty good link about what, uh, from last week, what actually is peer reviewed and what is not. Um, so that'll, that'll help you, that'll help guide you. Uh, I know we talked a lot about things like uh, IEEE, which may or may not be peer reviewed. All the JAMA stuff typically is because it doesn't get published otherwise. There are some uh, resources that will not allow publishing without getting peer reviewed. Um, but things like IEEE, uh, anything related to kind of engineering or tech standards and things like that are typically of good quality, especially if you go to the, those kinds of websites. You don't necessarily have to be peer reviewed, but they are typically editor reviewed um, from an engineering perspective. We'll talk a little bit tonight about the rubric. All right, so that rubric is posted. We'll talk about what a rubric is real quick. I know you've heard about them before, but we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, Continue on in sections four and five from the information literacy text. It's actually, uh, again, building the process and going a little bit further in to creating your research project. I will talk next week about the exam. So it'll be a sign. So um, I'm just giving you the heads up. I will kind of give you the heads up anyway, but. Um, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about the exam next week. It'll be assigned um, the following week. And then the way it's gonna work out is you won't have uh, major assignments due when you have an exam. That's typically the way I like to do it. So you'll, you'll have your, uh, your, your assignments, the one uh, now for citations is assigned tonight, due next week. Um, the exam will not be, so essentially you'll have your three pieces of your project, your research project already started by then. You'll have the exam, then we'll do Myers-Briggs. Um, we'll talk about Myers-Briggs in, uh, in week 16, which is a really great resource. I like that a lot. And uh, again, you'll have a week for your, your exam. So we'll talk about it next week. Let's get into some of our resources. So I'm also gonna talk a little bit about the value of soft skills too. We've been talking about them a lot. Uh, we talked about them a lot in week two, in week three. And I'll, I'll, I'll kind of touch on those again and where they fit into everything that we're doing here. Now, it isn't required. I'm, I'm gonna skip over this, the importance of soft skills at cnbc.com, make it article. You guys can take a look at that after uh, on your own time uh, outside of here. But we're gonna talk about just a few major areas of where we could actually get data. Now, I'm not expecting you or requiring you to get raw data for your, your project. All right, now, you can if you want. I'm gonna talk, let me look at that real quick. Um, basically, what raw data is gonna require is that you take the data, synthesize it, summarize it, and then be able to present it. So 
This is what a researcher would do if they were researching. They would gather all of this raw data. Maybe they would use a tool like Excel or R or Python or SPSS or one of those statistical packages to do the summary of the data and then they'll create some nice presentations out of it. Because as we talked about, if we had hundreds and thousands of rows, and we're gonna talk more about this in, the, in, the, in module two where we talk about data literacy, but you can't make heads or tails or any sense of data that is raw in its raw form and there's a lot of it. So you need some sort of way to synthesize that data. You need a way to summarize that data. Graphing was a great way to do it. Charting is a great way to do it. Um, I suspect that in your research, when you start coming across sources, some of that will already be done for you. So there'll be charts, there'll be data tables, there'll be uh, graphs, there'll be things that have already summarized that data for you. You can re refer to it, obviously, and use it in your, in your work. Um, but for the most part, those were all gathered using raw data. They were either gathered, they, if they were peer reviewed, they were probably built upon someone else's research uh, furthering it along in some cases, in some cases it's brand new. And in order for it to be credible and, and get to the, to, the, to the point of being printed and out in public domain, it's gonna have to have gone through review and it always comes from some raw data, all right? And there's just so much, th the thing about COVID is that there's so much raw data, well, I wanna say there's so much, there is now a lot of raw data. It wasn't at the beginning and that was big, one of the biggest problems for why we couldn't figure out uh, how to tackle this thing or how to approach it because there wasn't any raw data. We were learning as we went and we're still, still kind of learning as we go here. So that tough part about that is as you get data, you need to analyze it, summarize it, and now analyze it and then make sense of it and then peer review it. So it's, it's shortened the window for, for the time or the requirement and the need to get some information from our data. Now that is, that is gonna be a key topic. We talked about it a couple, of, actually we talked about it, I think week one or maybe week two. That theme will come back again in, in the data um, section because again, informatics is all about taking data and getting information from it. Actionable information, things that we can do, decisions we can make, directions we can go, products we can buy, businesses we decide that we, we can invest in or, or products we can invest in. It's all based on data, being able to analyze that data. So we'll, we'll look at the value of uh, raw data. We'll take a, look at, a little bit at, uh, of a look at public sources of free data sets. This is a great, great place. Um, and then I'm going to um, talk a little bit about, I'm gonna jump to this USA Facts. I think I mentioned it last week. This website right here, this USA Facts, is an interesting um, website in that uh, the former um, CEO of Microsoft, Steve Ballmer, when he left Microsoft, basically took this on as a sort of a side project. And, it, and, and quite honestly, it's free. You don't have to pay to get onto it. And what it does is it takes all of the raw data that we've got, that the government basically and in, in industry and in research institutions and education and universities create, uh, gather, and it actually starts to extract it and put it into a form where it's easily consumable. So it's good visuals, easy to, um, easy to understand from uh, um, a digested perspective. So in other words, it's made the trend lines for you in some cases. It's shown you the visuals. It's already done the analysis, all right? And this is actually a very interesting one. Even if you don't use it for your project that's interesting um, otherwise because it, it, it kind of gets into the some of the the trends in, in, in topics of, of the day you know that what, what are current in our in our news and presents it in a way that you don't have to do the analysis okay, so the data has essentially been analyzed for you uh, factual not not slanted not um, no agenda here on this website. It's basically facts, and that's why they call it USA Facts. So it's a good one. Um, again, it's, it's easy to consume because it does a lot of these uh, summarization for us already. So it's one of my, one of my favorites in terms of, um, in, one of the nice things about that is that if you hear um, some of the politicians uh, spewing out stats or spewing out um, statistics or what seems to be like statistics, 
you find a lot of the organizations that try to vet that information will come to USA Facts. And, and, and is that really true? Are those numbers really correct? Where'd they get their numbers from? Um, a lot of times politicians will pick, cherry pick things um, to try to make a point, right? And that's one of the things that we've learned about. So great, great website. Help for uh, annotated bibliography. A lot of hope or help for being able to get that bibliography, annotated bibliography, written very simply and easy. Um, again, more resources to help you make this paper uh, very simple to do, very easy to write, lots of resources. Keep these handy um, and keep them handy, keep the links handy if, you know, for, for future as well. Citation Fox, I have this link right here. This is to the University of Albany Citation Fox link, but this one specifically talks about APA. All right, so that, and, and the reason why I put this one on here is because that seems to be one of the areas, it seems to be every, practically every research project that we do, or any research project that anyone doesn't hear anyway, has at least one of those as a source. All right, so it's the citing an author on a website and the APA style for doing that, the perfect exact model or example for doing it. Very simple, very easy. Um, you know, tools. And then obviously your uh, upload page for, um, for, for the project. All right. Again, you want to use Citation Fox as your guide. This one, I would prefer, again, I think I talk about it. Um, Blackboard doesn't do a great job on the it doesn't do a great job on the right submission in terms of formatting. If, if you format it ahead of time, so if you format your, your sources using Citation Fox, copy and paste them uh, and make sure if, when you do that, you get the formatting because sometimes Blackboard drops formatting in that right submission section right here. And what you end up is just a bunch of text all uh, glued together because it, all the formatting is gone from it. So you want to you want to make sure that that formatting stays in there. Or the other option is to obviously upload a, uh, a Word document, um, which definitely will keep your formatting. All right, so let's just take a quick look at this one. Yeah, so open data. Now, I'm, we're just going to go over this one particular link right here. There's there's a number of other videos out here that talk about what open data is. Um, it's really kind of along the same lines as open source. I think we talked about that a few weeks back. Does everybody remember that term open source? It seems like everything is open these days. So you have open education resources, which is kind of what we're using in here. So you don't have to go out and buy a proprietary written book for this. The information literacy text is an open education resource. That means it's put in the public domain and used with permission. Same thing with software. I mean, Linux. If anybody's ever used Linux or ever heard of Linux, it's open source, meaning you can download a version of that Linux onto a computer for free and not have to buy a license to run the operating system. Right? And along with most of those versions comes an office-like suite. Office-like, basically, you know, very similar in functionality. Now, a lot of, you know, given the fact that we've got, going back to Gordon Moore, uh, week one or week two, and the ubiquity and the, the speed and the, uh, the capability of technology and how rapidly it, it increases in terms of capacity and, and redu reduction in cost, that you, voila, we have open data, all right? So open data is one of those things where now we've got data sets published or the ability to share data, and that's gonna be, it's very, very important. And that was one of the, probably, um, maybe one of the stumbling blocks in early COVID um, tracking and detection is that it wasn't necessarily a real, um, I don't want to say willingness, but there just wasn't a real great way to share data and what was learned. There was a lot of pockets. Everybody was off trying to figure out, you know, trying to, trying to figure this thing out and figure out where it was going to head next. And there wasn't a lot of um, 
sharing. And then as, as time went on, um, you know, organizations like, because the CDC was kind of behind the, behind the curve on that. They relied on third parties like Johns Hopkins and research universities like that in order to be able to gather some of these data. So then we started to see that data becoming published and open. And now you can get, you know, data sets on this where you can literally track it from its origin day by day uh, in, in all of this, all of the statistics of the day by day in open data sets. So that is definitely something that you're going to want to uh, remember uh, when it comes time to either do another project or when it comes time to leave here. So whenever you can find something that is an open public domain, it's usually a pretty good place to start. All right. So that way, um, and in a lot of cases, even like, um, like I think there was one or two, there are one or two of, of uh, my prior uh, INF 131 class uh, students in here where we learned R in that class. R is an open source tool, very, very uh, much supported by a large community around the world. All right, and it's a great analytics tool, great tool for analyzing large data sets. All right, so be aware, know that this kind of stuff exists and this kind of might be the one of the, because it make your job so much easier, whatever it is you're doing, to, to know that uh, you have the ability to uh, grab open sources. And I'll see what my speaker's at 100%. I don't want to blow everybody's ears out. Let it reverberate. So I'm going to turn it down just a bit. Sounds loud enough. Of course, that video. Is Open data is the data which governments collect on our behalf and is paid for by our taxes. So it is our public data and for our use. Open data is not subject to data protection laws or other such limitations. It is made available by governments in open and non-proprietary formats and is machine readable so that computers can quickly and easily analyze and make use of it. So why should governments publish their data? Open data enables transparency and new forms of open governance whereby citizens are able to see and engage directly with the underlying information from which decisions are made. Open data therefore enables participation and cooperative relationships between citizens and governments to emerge. It allows for collaboration across different data sources and enables the combining of public and private data. Open data has the potential to stimulate economic opportunity and the development of new businesses, products and services. Importantly, it has social good and value as it can improve our public services. The principles underlining open data can be traced back to the European Enlightenment and changes that came about at this time in relation to democracy, accountability, and the systems of checks and balances which enable governance and administration. The freedom of information and the right to access records held by government and public departments also emerged during the US and French Revolution. All right, we're not gonna go on to the next video. You can certainly do that if you want. Potential of open data is, is, is kind of limitless. Um, so there, there are definitely pros and cons of open data. Now we know that <laughs> one of the reasons um, that we've had to be able to put a wall up on our data is because sometimes the line blurred or companies took into their own hands the, uh, uh, what's the right word? Um, poetic, um, I don't know what the right words because I don't want to offend them, but they basically were a little bit loose and uh, fast and loose with uh, our data, in which case um, data then had to be treated as more of an asset. So we draw the line on open data versus proprietary data and or personal information. So I think we talked about a few weeks back, the GDPR in in Europe, which protects all of citizens' data. Any public entity that, that has or has collected data from an individual has the ability, or the individual has the ability to ask for and demand and actually gets executed the removal of that data. So, and if companies found in violation of that, they actually pay fines. 
We do not, we do not have that in this country yet. Um, California has the CCPA, uh, Cal California Consumer Privacy Act, I believe it's called, um, which does something very, very similar to that. But again, that's only for California residents. So um, data is everywhere, it is ubiquitous, and we have the ability to gather and save and post data, but having that line or drawing that line between what is public data or open data and what is PII, personal identifiable information, is typically where we have to, um, have to draw, the, draw the line on that. So that's a um, couple of the videos that follow that one talk about that, one, that particular thing. Now, there are companies who do anonymize that data and they roll up that data. Facebook's a great example of it. They have data on people but all of it is anonymized and it's all rolled up or synthesized. So they may talk about a demographic. Well, you're a detail in that demographic, but you are not called out specifically in that, that particular uh, item. So that's, a, that's, a, that's an area where um, in the informatics field, if you do get into that field, or even if you get into any field that has data related, um, you'll have any kind of data related responsibilities. That'll be one thing that you'll have to be very aware of. If you ever get into healthcare, which if you're gonna get into informatics, you might get into healthcare, HIPAA. The rules, healthcare, information portability, and accountability act. Um, make sure that that data is protected and not, well, there's a bunch of things that are, are part of that. One is data is not owned by a provider. Data is, uh, the, owner, the owner of that data is the person, and that data must be protected. So there's a number of different, um, there's a number of different provisions within HIPAA. It's more than just pr privacy, that's more, um, about data and the ownership of that data, which kind of gets sort of like GDPR. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of these public sources. Now, the, the, the uh, University of Missouri does a fairly good job at this. There's lots of links. The, our library has a pretty good section too on this. Um, but the one thing that I liked about the U University of Missouri's libraries is it kind of it makes it, it kind of, um, it starts off at a very, very high level. So it, it, it ranges um, data set links by larger topic versus uh, trying to uh, get to the granular data set before you even know what it is you want to search for. Because when is it, what ends up happening is you kind of search around them and you don't necessarily hit what it is that you're looking for. So if you start at a very, very high level and then drill your way down, which is kind of what this website does, um, it's actually really good. And not only that, it, it covers not just American, uh, United States kind of data, it, it uh, covers data from around the world as well. Whereas in most university libraries, you have to do a search first in order to be able to find out what you're looking for. Right? The idea here is that we've got uh, high level topics like poli-sci, uh, demographics data, and again, it's the web, right? So you go to one of those links, guaranteed there's gonna be links to other links. All right, so easy way to get to at least the starting point at which you can conduct your research. Economics, again, there's, there's just lots, um, lots of stuff that we can go to. The, uh, yeah, and, and the other thing too I like about this one, I knew there was one other thing. It's this, this capability for uh, some of these tools. So ParseHub, WebHose, DataStreamer, Outwit, there's others as well. Um, but these, these kind of help you gather and, and extract that data into some for, sort of format that you actually can use it. Uh, PDF converters and things like that. So this is a real good, real good resource to start with. If you haven't done it yet, um, you're going to want to do that. And we talk, well, let's go into USA Facts again. No, actually, that's not, we've been there. So one of the other areas that I wanted to talk to you about is the raw data sets, if you decided that you wanted to use them. Berkeley has a great uh, beginning uh, library of data sets where you can actually get the raw data from and again, it starts off with um, 
a very high level, and then it draws down into some of the more, more subject matter specific data sets, um, health data sets, data, data, uh, data sets on planet, data.gov, which is a great website, but again, it's, it's like drinking from a fire hose. It's just a ton of data. Um, and it almost you, requires you to know what you're looking for before you actually get there. This helps you kind of try to figure that out. So University of Berkeley is a real good one to start off with from a uh, data statistics perspective. You do anything with health, they're like one of the better uh, health and statistics and uh, public health libraries. We talked, I think, last time or the time before about this one data set that the government produces called the BRFSS, Behavioral Risk Factors Surveillance Survey. Pretty sure it's what it is. And it has, in it, it's a single data set. It has in it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of data elements. Right? And those data elements actually are used on a daily basis by researchers um, to see uh, trends. Again, it's trends from all different areas of health um, as either gotten through survey, gotten through uh, the, the uh, reporting that medical agencies and hospitals and clinics have to do. And all of that data is gathered and brought into data sets. So the question is, are we making any progress on uh, smoking cessation in this country? Well, I mean, it's hard to find data on that. But if you go to the BRFSS, BRFSS that is like one of their specialties. All right? So it, it has, um, well, it's one of many of their specialties, but it has data that you can't really get otherwise. It's got data from clinics, it's got data from hospitals, it's got data from uh, surveys all brought together on smoking cessation. So if you were a researcher and wanted to know if you we were doing, uh, and again, a lot of our public, um, public service announcements, I guess is probably the best way to put it, use this kind of data to, to figure out how to target. All right, you've probably seen the smoking commercials lately where someone has um, come on and either had a horribly disfiguring um, surgery to remove cancer uh, because they were a smoker, right? Well, visuals and demographic, uh, there's, it's geared towards a, a particular demographic, uh, obviously there. And whether or not we should even be bothering spending our time or money on that, well, you look at that data to find out. We, are we reducing the number or are we increasing the number? What are the deaths by uh, tobacco-related products in a year? Well, if those numbers aren't coming down, then there's definitely going to be some money to fund helping find ways to do that. Public service is usually a good way to do that. All right? Again, that's why we're in informatics, right? Data, using data to make decisions and, and, and act on, on, on these decisions. Let's talk about... Um, I talk about Citation Fox just for a second here because I want you to be able to navigate this one fairly easy. So this is our, this is the UAlbany link to Citation Fox. There's actually, they, they're, they're covering three styles. I haven't seen the Chicago style covered all that much, but they cover the APA style, they cover the MLA style, and the Chicago style. So inside the styles, there's a book you can download if you want that talks about uh, exactly how to do this. Quite honestly, I don't know, I don't know about you, but I, would, I never wanted to memorize this thing. It's too much, too much clutter. Um, when you can look something up, you might as well you know, use your uh, brain power and space for, for things where um, you can't look up and you, <laughs> you have to figure out. That's, that's at least my opinion anyway. But if I can look it up, I'm not going to memorize it. I'll just come here and try to figure it out. So here, you'll actually get um, lots of examples. So you've got text works, meaning books. You've got data sets. You've got audio visual. You've got online media. I think with those four, talk about online media. With those four links there, that ought to cover the vast majority of the research that you're gonna do. So Facebook references, Instagram, LinkedIn, online forums, TikTok, Twitter, uh, web page on a, on a website reference, clinical practice, open education, poll. So there's just lots of different ways that you can actually 
uh, get examples of how to, to cite something. And again, there it is right there. So there's really no reason. So there's web page and a news website. So you found a piece of uh, um, information that you want to use because it thinks it makes a good source for you. That's exactly how you would you would reference it right there. Copy and paste very simply into your um, into your research sources. Right? Can't get any easier than that. Data sets. Those are a little, uh, a little more complex because there's so many different kinds of data sets that we get. Um, whether you go to a, uh, and actually here, here's a good one too. Now we don't, so you don't, um, you can't drop a podcast into a paper, although you could put a link in there. I don't really necessarily need you to do that. But for the most part, if there's a piece of information or something on a podcast that's very interesting that actually works with you, you can use it. And you can cite it using something very similar to this right here. So practically every media type that you would use in your, in your paper, in your research, you would actually, um, you know, you can, you can pull it out of here and, and, cite, and cite it very simply and easily. All right. Don't get any easier than that. All right. Now, what I want to talk about next, I'm not going to go in the, into this, uh, this uh, website, Very Good Resources from Open Academics, but practically every little help, and again, stuff that you'll even do outside of here, um, and how to write, whether it's a, um, a paper, an email, a reference letter, or any kind of um, uh, important communication that you need to have, there's some really good tips in this particular website and they're from open academics which is again another great place to uh, to find to find resources to help you out and again in electronic format which is very nice you can actually copy and paste it again don't memorize something that you can actually look up and that that happens to be a lot of stuff these days all right so let's let's talk about the rubric what I want to do is I want to go over this rubric um, and then I want to go over the, um, the talk about these soft skills a little bit and then I want to go into the text in um, these chapters uh, four and five. We'll, we'll do that a little bit later, but I want to talk a little bit about the, the uh, rubric right now. Again, quite honestly, you can use, how is that for reading? Yeah, it's not too bad. Um, it's rubrics can be used in academics and they can be used outside of academics and I'll give you a case in point so rubrics are a real uh, a good tool that help represent the performance expectations for an assignment or a piece of work the rubric divides the assigned work into component parts and provides clear description of the characteristics of work associated with each component at varying levels of mastery. Now that is probably the key point here, at varying levels of mastery. So what that does is it takes away some of the subjectivity when it comes down to scoring or reviewing any kind of work. Now, uh, let's see, I don't have a marker, but I, I, will, I want to talk a little bit about it. I don't know if I'll use this whiteboard or not. There's no markers, but I do want to talk about um, our rubric, which I will talk about in a second, but I want to talk about using that rubric in a real world, real life example. Uh, and how it became important. So the, um, so I worked for a consulting company by day and the client that I have is looking to bring on a vendor to help with additional work. So the workload is high, but it'll probably go down. So it's a temporary spike in work. The work needs to get done, 
And when you see spikes in work, you typically don't hire for spikes, but you outsource or get additional contract work, contractors to work for the spike. And then when the spike is over with, you're back down to your regular staffing. Well, they happen to be a uh, public entity that must show how they made their decision on qualified vendors for bidding. Well, how do they do that? Well, they used a rubric. So they took the vendors that had bid on the particular work, and so the vendors were in columns, which is kind of the way I'm gonna show our rubric in a second, and the criteria for what was important was down the side in rows. And then inside were scores for um, below average, average, exceeds expectations or above expectations. So you had a low, a, middle, a low, a middle, and a high, basically is what it boils down to. And each one of those categories is a score. So low would be from zero to 10, let's say. Mid might be from 11 to 20. And, and above or high might be from 21 to 30. So each category has some level of total points that can be earned. And the rubric, so you, you evaluate, so the, 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 the client is evaluating each of these vendors against these categories and assigning a score. So at the end of the day, they can come back and say, this company won because they had the highest score. Very objective way of doing it. In a way that, in in a way that, will keep them from litigation, being sued, favoritism, um, any allegations of impropriety in terms of awarding a pretty good size contract. All right, it's a way for them to objectively do this and still be, in in still be an objective way to do it in a way that they can easily then, because again, they're a public entity, if that information was ever asked for or foiled or foiled, um, freedom of information request, they would actually be able to present that data. So not only is a rubric good for uh, something like academics, it's also good for things that maybe are outside of academics. And you can always use that in your own, um, criteria if you're trying to score anything and being very objective in the scoring and, and if you ever get stuck in a, in a situation where you can't figure out whether one is better than the other because of uh, one reason or another or some sort of subjectivity you can always pull out a rubric and say hey this is important this is important this is important, this is important. here are the scores for those and here's what the scores were all right so they're not just an academic thing is basically what I'm what I'm trying to say here all right so um, you've probably, you've seen them, I'm sure. You've seen them in high school, I'm sure. I've seen them, you've seen them in college as well. Um, but again, they're, they're there to, to kind of um, guide, guide scoring and make uh, scoring more objective and less subjective. Because right? we want to take subjectivity out of uh, as much, you want to try to take subjectivity out of as much performance measurement as well. Take subjectivity out of measurement. And that is kind of what, you know, in, informatics is all about. In, you gather your data. You're not gonna, you don't know what that data is. You're just gathering, it's raw data. You're not gonna try to influence it. The data is gonna be the data. You've probably heard that. It is what it is. The data is the data. Let it show us what it is. Um, and that's kind of where, where we get with rubrics as well. Let's just talk about ours for this project. And I'll come up on soft skills. All right, so this actually has four categories to it, kind of making it even more, um, even more granular in terms of um, how, how this thing is measured. So you've got a novice, you've got an apprentice, you've got a proficient, you've got an expert. Now this isn't, this is actually, yeah, it is for research project. So this particular rubric talks about knowledge, um, information, or integration of knowledge. In other words, what, 
what did you do about the research? What, what does, what research did you gather and how did you present that in such a way that it actually shows that you research the topic and you understand the topic and you understand what you're reading? All right, that, that's what this first one measures. Topic focus, again, hopefully that is not gonna be a problem. Everybody's gonna be fine with that because in that first assignment, we narrowed in on our focus. We, we narrowed in on our topic, our research topic, such that we shouldn't stray from it all that much. Right? There's, you're gonna obviously need to have some background information. You may have things that actually help it um, along the way in terms of um, explaining it, but you shouldn't vary too much or stray too far from it. And then depth of discussion, another one of these things that's in the rubric. Um, and it talks about each of the um, levels of, of expertise. In-depth, so I'll start off with um, novice. So cursory discussion in all sections of the paper or brief discussion in only a few sections. And then as you move up the scale, the writer has uh, omitted pertinent content or content runs on excessively. Quotations from others is all the paper basically is a bunch of quotations. And then uh, mastery up uh, one other level, in-depth discussion and elaboration in most sections of the paper. So again, that's why we take the topic, we break it down into four points that we're gonna use to base our research topic. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna research and uh, look for material that are support our four topics and then we're gonna write in depth and it'll, it'll all bolster the research topic. And then the, the expertise, in-depth discussion and elaboration in all sections of the paper. All right. Cohesiveness, yeah, that, one, that one's kind of a little more, um, um, that one really shouldn't be a problem. That one's more, uh, if you follow your outline, then the paper should be very cohesive. You should always be all in the upper, at least in the upper two uh, categories in terms of um, your paper. Spelling and grammar, there's really no, no reason to not have that decent because Word or Sheets or, or Word or doc, Docs or um, any of the other uh, online tools are good at spelling and grammar. Shouldn't be an issue there. Sources. Now I've talked about having four sources uh, and nailed down four sources. I don't, the reason why this says more than three is because I don't want to force anybody to use just four. Right? So if you do more than three, well, you're going to have at least four. So um, that's kind of why it was a little open-ended there. Um, but you can have more than four if you want it. Um, so if we come up to the expertise, more than three current sources, you can look at the word current, right? We learned last week that um, there is going to be some level of currency in all of your research, of which at least one is a peer-reviewed journal article, scholarly book. Sources include both general background sources and specialized sources. Um, special internet sources and popular literature, again, all opened. I didn't really say that it's got to be uh, peer reviewed from the JAMA, all right? So that's why we talk in here about what is considered um, good enough to be peer reviewed. So it's peer, it says peer reviewed articles or scholarly books, sources such as, so it gives you a lot of leeway there. Again, the idea being that you're going to use your judgment in determining what is credible given the guidelines we talked about over the last couple of weeks for credibility, all right? And that you'll be able to use forever in any kind of work that you do. And then citations, again, we all know that, um, and we've worked on citations, that's one of your assignments, so that, that should be an easy one, that we should get 100 on that one. Um, and then visual requirements. Right, so there's only three no more than a third of a page. So again, another rubric. All right, so it's three, all are there, a third of a page. There's gonna be real no judgment around how good is the visual. It's gonna be more of, is that visual there? And is, are there three, and three only? And are they 
um, a third of a page or less. I mean, it doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to measure it out, but um, just it's given you a guideline. Cover page is either present or it's not. And then the eight to 10, not including the cover page and, and uh, citations. All right, so um, for each one of these, I will, I don't think I have numbers on there, but I'll have numbers on it. Um, by the time you're getting ready, probably around the midterm point, I'll have numbers on there. So you can kind of judge your work against each of those. A lot of categories there. Sometimes rubrics don't have this many rows. There's lots and lots of rows there, which give you a lot of capabilities and a lot of uh, opportunity for getting good grade. So that's the rubric. Now I do want to talk, um, There's one other topic I wanted to talk about here. Uh, I'll come back to it. I'll remember it at some point. And University Library main page. Obviously, right here, we have a, um, a University Library. It's a, it's a decent, decent uh, website. Hopefully, you've used it before. Um, the... I don't know if you'll you'll need to borrow any books. I'm not, you know, it depends on if you want to use books or not. Some of the books that you might want to use for any of your research are actually Google's already um, kind of indexed them. Um, they've indexed them and they're they're available digitally. The one thing that I do want to get some tools. I did want to show you that. So if you go over to the tools section, here is an area where you're. you're you might want to start if you're if you're not finding what you need on some of the other resources that I gave you. If you if you click on the tools, the tools actually has a pretty good area um, for things like database finders, journal finders. Right? So if there's something that you actually needed to find, and even if you don't get all of the text from that journal from this particular link on the web on the uh, library, you'll know what it is and you can find it on Google. Um, so if we were doing something with uh, see, science, streaming video, yeah, let's take a look at science real quick. Even, so what, what they'll do is here, you can actually, and the idea behind this thing is you can find a particular edition, a particular uh, volume a particular name of a source based on the things you're looking for. In other words, you can find what it is. And then from here, you'll be able to either go and get the actual text of it, or you can look, look for it on the internet as well. All right, but the idea here, this is more of an index. This is more of like a search engine kind of thing. What resources will give me these kinds of topics? That's what this is for. They may not necessarily drill down into the actual text of that. That will ha you'll have to find in another resource or um, in another link on the internet. Very, very easy. But the idea is you can find the, the, the names of sources that will give you what it is you need to look for um, in, in, your, uh, in your research. That's, that's, that's a pretty good one. I like that one a lot. Let's go forward here. Data and statistics. And if you need to find statistics on any one of your census, there's this, obviously the census, the OECD statistics. And they'll point you to where informatics, good places, again, it. You're going to find a lot of that is related to. So there's the IEEE and IET electronic library. If you're doing anything with technology, if you're doing anything with, well, doing pretty much anything technology, any compu anything computer related, anything um, wireless networking or networking or any security, cybersecurity, any of that kind of stuff, the uh, IEEE is a good place to start for that. 
and you can actually get some of these reprints. You know, for the most part, IEEE is free for universities. The, um, some of these articles, if they get into in-depth discussions around the technology that you're trying to research, they may require you to create an account, but it'll be a free account, especially if it's a .edu email that, um, that you actually sign up with. Right, so IEEE typically only uh, charges for um, companies. So companies that are gonna build, companies that are gonna build, let's see, um, technical working groups. Oh, it's hard to see that, but. Uh, here are all the standards for um, spectrometers and optical networks and high-speed internet and fiber optics on a chip. So again, the point being is that this organization right here is the organization that laid out all of the standards for these technologies such, they would, such that they would work and then companies built product around it. So if you wanted to know anything about wireless networking, for instance, and how all the wireless networking works and how it transmits pretty seamlessly through the air, you'd, you'd look at wireless networking here and that would give you the standards and how actually that was created. And then companies built product based around it. So this kind of journal would be a good journal for um, the kind of peer reviewed work that we actually have to do. Uh, let's see, what else did I want to talk about here? I'm not going to look at the stuff. Well, I'm not going to look at this article right here. I'm going to take a look at this PowerPoint. Yeah, there's one other thing. I'll come back to it. All right. Um, what do we have here? I'll take a break. So we'll take a break at about 7.05, it's about 10 minutes from now. All right, so value soft skills, again, a lot of these in, in conjunction, in adjunct to what we're talking about here. We talked um, a few times about these sort of at a, at a very, very high level. We're going to kind of get into some of these things, um, which again, are all part of the 21st century education and, and all wrap around and within the 21st century inform, information in the 21st century. Um, so what are some of the port, important soft skills? Well, communication, we talked about it. Uh, body language, I mean, that's one of those, maybe not as important, but it, it definitely does uh, play a role in soft skills. Making decisions, self-motivation, leadership skills, team working skills, creativity and problem solving, and time management. Uh, we talked about some of these the first week of class. This digs deeper, a little bit deeper anyway, into how a lot of these things relate to the workplace and how they're all tied together in making your hard skills, the things you're learning you know, in your major, in your minor, uh, more effective in, in making you more effective at being able to employ those. All right, so that's really what this section is about. Soft skills is a real good synonym for people skills. Describes those attributes that indicate a high level of emotional intelligence. I think that's a key term these days. A lot We hear a lot about emotional intelligence or emotional IQ, that kind of thing. Um, companies are starting to really focus in on that now. They, they, um, they're starting to see that you know, these are the kinds of things that, in addition to hard skills, are, are what pe you know, separate people from um, average to above average and allow them to really help pull people along and move organizations forward. So unlike hard skills, which describes your technical skills and ability to perform a specific task, soft skills are broadly applicable across every job title and every industry. And quite honestly, anytime there's, even in uh, industries where um, the job is, is very technical and you don't have a lot of interaction with people, they're still, they're still applicable. There's no, there's no two ways about that. Um, it's often said that hard skills will get you an interview, but you need the soft skills to get and keep the job. And I like that because I think that's very true. Um, soft skills are important to help interpersonal relations. 
to take and make appropriate decisions, to communicate effectively. Right? Communication is a very big piece of, of being successful in, in, uh, in the workplace. To have a good impression and impact uh, to gain professional development. Okay, all successful endeavors are the re result of human effort. All right, so you know, no matter what it is that we do, we still have to. So we're 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 good at executing our job. We're good at executing our hard skills. Those are human effort, and, and our soft skills wrap around those things again, and they're all part of human effort. So it's an area where, um, when you know how to employ these, or at least are aware of these anyway, they make your they make your hard skills, the skills that you're good at and the things that you learned um, in college, uh, in, in your major, you know, that much more successful. So it's typically stuff you don't learn in your major, right? That's why a lot of times, you know, uh, schools will require that you get an internship. Okay, that's one of the reasons why you get an internship because you, you get a chance to see how to relate in a workplace or an environment where you're going to be at some point in the very near future. That's one of the reasons why. And you learn a lot that way um, when, you, when, you take a, when you take an internship. You learn how the norms of organizations, because if you're a business major or you've done anything in psychology, you know that all organizations have a typical norm, if you will. There's norms. Um, you've probably heard the term in teams, um, I'll get the first two swap, but I, I, I swap them like I, because I, I think they're, um, you can, you can swap them. So forming, storming, norming, and conforming. If you've ever heard of those terms before in teams. So, so forming a team, storming a team, so the team comes together and begins to figure out their roles. So forming, storming, norming. All right, so fill in, everyone's accepted into their role. So if we worked on a team, the people will kind of fall into things they're comfortable with and they norm into their role and then they conform and then they perform. So you can really say that there's conforming and then there's performing after that. Conforming is kind of the, the same as performing as well because that's the end result. Um, in, even in teams, it's tough to do that at the university level in classrooms, but we still try, we still you know, at least give you the, the, um, the experience anyway of, of working in a team setting. So uh, forming, storming, norming, conforming, and you know, if you wanted to add the, the last one of performing, you could add that in there because sometimes it's added in, sometimes it's lumped in with conforming. So communication skills, um, we talked about that. Let's do our break now. We'll come back and then I want to talk a little bit about the two chapters in our textbooks. We'll take a 15 minute break. Be back at 7.17.
Okay, so we'll uh, we'll pick up at the rest of this slide deck, then we'll take a look at the. There's a there's a couple of sections in in our text that I want to review and just just highlight in there that I think are important and are very useful. Um, again, kind of reiterating some of the things that we talked about over the last few weeks. All right, so communication skills, right? So um, always, if you're ever in the job market or going to be in the job market fairly soon, you're going to you're going to see this as one of your uh, probably top top one third anyway of all the bullet items, regardless of the of the job, even technical jobs, same thing. Communication skills, um, they're usually at or near the top of any uh, essential skills list. And that the communication skills is um, it's it's more than just being able to speak. It's more than able to being able to just write. Um, communication, quite honestly, and, and really some of the best communicators are the ones that are lit, are the listeners. There's more listening than speaking um, in a lot of cases, and those are the, those are typically the ones that uh, are the most effective when it comes to um, communication skills. And even uh, negotiators, and, and um, uh, whether it's contractual negotiators and negotiators for um, uh, unions or wherever wherever there's a uh, um, an outcome required that requires communication, a lot of the best communicators are the ones that listen and listen very well more than they do hear. Um, it's more than just hearing, so they're listening to what the other person's saying. So, um, just I think that skill alone really kind of uh, makes you a better communicator. Body language. I don't want to get in too much into body language because this one can be. Um, Overly, I think it's going to be overdone. And the last thing I want to do is say, hey, you got to be very wary about every single thing that you uh, do with uh, your body language in any one situation. But I don't, it is a, it is kind of a um, one of those communication skills. It's nonverbal communication, obviously. And a lot of times you can sort of gauge uh, what people are thinking if they don't speak based on body language. And that's really kind of all I want to get on there is that there's enough clues in body language to be able to give you information about what other people are thinking if they're not communicating with you. But as far as telling you what to do, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and then decision making. Um, again, informatics class, we want to have data. We want to be able to make good decisions and we want to be able to make decisions without too much hesitation. So you get really good at this when you've determined and again, this a lot of times takes time to, to really cultivate this skill, but it's knowing when you've got the information that you need in order to be able to make the decision. Um, no matter what it is or whatever that decision is, um, typically there's um, not enough information known until you ask a lot of questions. Um, once you have that, have all the information that you need in order to make a decision, you want to make a decision to make it pretty quick uh, and move on. Um, Again, part of the whole tangential discussion about data and information, you need it in order to make good decisions. And making decisions, or making decisions without having good information is usually, um, usually doesn't turn out or pan out the way you want. Right? And that's why, quite honestly, organizations, uh, business and uh, public and private have now, these days anyway, teams of people in technology that gather data to present as much information as possible so decisions can be made quickly, accurately, and correctly. That's probably the best way to put it. So you make the right decision. I think we talked about last time where, um, where we, we analyze data in, in situations where we may make an investment decision or we make an, may make an organizational decision or we may make a product decision. Um, and having that data to drive information is really what makes a competitor better than its competition. Right? And that's why there's so much time and effort these days spent on analytics and machine learning because it's taking the data that we generate continuously, being able to understand it and being able to action it. It used to be uh, pre, 
pre, uh, that's, what's the right word? I don't want to say pre-social media, but it's pre data and technology ubiquity. So in other words, before technology really became mature, we, we were able to do things like this, you know, use this kind of device in our hands very simply and easily. Before that, a lot of the decisions were made around manufacturing. They were made around financial decisions. Now we make decisions upon the data that we get from people's fee, uh, tweets or feeds or um, Instagram or whatever the expression of um, information is or an expression of data is, right? So um, the, 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 the need for information or the need to understand our information hasn't changed, but the kind of, infor kind of data that we do consume now is much different. Right? And again, you can't get to this point um, without having good information. Right? And that's really kind of the point of it how it all ties into informatics and data. Well, you, you gather as much of that as you can in order to be able to make informed decisions that are correct. Making that decision to invest in, um, let's try to find an example where, um, a good example and a bad example. Um, uh, I could use some computer examples that are bad, but basically the idea is that some companies made bad decisions. Um, oh, well, I guess we could go back to um, Microsoft. So um, literally, I think this goes back, boy, I don't know how old is Bill Gates now. Um, this goes way back. Um, and, and I only know because I read this um, in, a, in a, one of my computer science books very, very early on when I was taking computer science classes. IBM passed on um, Bill Gates' operating system uh, when he presented it to IBM. So basically he said, you know what? We can write software that will control this computer. And we'll call it an operating system. And all we got to do is we got to load it up, we got to run it, and it'll control all the hardware and the peripherals. So he did his dog and pony show with IBM, and IBM passed on it. They said, no one will ever use a personal computer. Computers are big machines that we have in offices and in data centers, and no one's ever going to need a computer. So we're going to pass on your, op on, your, on your vision. All right? So there's a bad decision. <laughs> they didn't have good data, and they made a bad decision. So voila, Microsoft. That's probably one of the ones that you guys can relate to. Um, there's a lot of tons of other roadkill along the way that, you know, companies that have made bad decisions along the way based on bad information. And they've made the decision, but then there's bad information. Um, so again, getting back to why we gather data and why we try to process the data, get information so we can make great decisions. Now those, again, another self or another personal trait, which again, I'm not going to tell you what you should and shouldn't be doing. However, this is one of those traits, and I think we talked about it a few weeks ago, that um, people that are typically the ones that take their, their, their hard skills and, and are able to get the most mileage out of them are typically the ones that have great self-motivation. You, know, you, can, you, can, you can tell from um, you know, your, your classmates and, um, and friends, um, you know, those who kind of get stuff done on time and, and study for exams and, and, do, and put the work in typically um, do better off do better when it comes to, to school. Same thing, same thing in the workplace. Um, you can just sort of coast along or you can basically um, take what you're, you know, improve upon your skills and take, take what you have and, and, and build upon it, as far as I'm gonna go with that one. Um, leadership really is, um, this is a, it's an interesting term because a lot, of, a lot of books have been written about it and a lot of uh, discussion around what is leadership. And leadership really is one of those things that. Um, can manifest itself and, and, and show up even when you're not managing others. Um, it's really kind of the um, being both self-motivated and the ability to motivate others. So if you wrap a lot of things like the ability to communicate effectively and an aptitude for both self-motivating and motivating others. So what you do here is you kind of get others to come along with you. And that's sort of the leadership. So you're going out, you're going out in front and kind of seeing the direction and then, and then kind of um, bringing others along with you to, to, to go in that same direction. Obviously, when we, we talk about big companies, 
you know, leadership in the big companies, it's their people's job to follow the leader, right? In those kinds of situations. But leadership in its, in, uh, in its purest form is more than just having a whole large organization of people that have to follow you, otherwise they get fired, right? Because what's their, what's their, their incentive? Well, their incentive is to keep their job so that and they're not gonna dissent from the boss. Um, so, you know, in those cases, leadership can be sort of, sort of false because it's, um, you know, it's there because the organization puts it there. Whereas the, the term leadership is more about these la that last sentence there, positive attitude and outlook and the ability to communicate effectively and an aptitude for both self-motivating motivating and motivating others. So having others join along with you um, in, in a quest. And it can be manifested in lots of different ways. It can be large, it can be small, it can be, um, continuous or it can be you know, one of these things where you know you, you find a, a time that were makes sense for you so as far as I'm gonna go with that one. and then teamwork um, we all know we've all been team players probably at one point um, in one time or another it's really more important these days now and I wish the uh, audio was a little bit better um, last week the audio in here is really horrible um, the Eric Reese video that talked about the pivot and he talked about that. He talked about it quickly in, in, on your computer speakers outside of here, it should be fairly easy uh, to listen to that. But the idea there is pivoting based on new information. Well, yeah, definitely is part of it, but guess what? You typically have a team around making that happen. And then the team these days is more important because teams need to move faster these days than ever before. All right, so that, that pivot or that lean startup was all about learning and, and pro you've probably heard the term in some of your other classes, fail fast. It's kind of the same concept as, as lean startup or pivoting, you fail fast. Well, test your assumptions, see if, they, if they're gonna, if they're gonna or test your idea and your assumptions and see if they're going to work, see if they're, they're going to be successful. And if they're not, then drop them and move on. So pivot um, and, and, and fail fast. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's actually the best thing for a startup to do is fail fast because you don't want to spend time, effort down a road that ultimately ends in, in uh, a dead end when you know that if you can test that, uh, test that assumption or test that business model or test that idea early, um, you can make that decision to drop it and pivot somewhere else. All right? And it all kind of goes along the same way because if you don't have teams and teamwork that can make that happen, then you're not going to be successful in being able to execute that pivot. Um, so that is another area where um, teams are important. And teams are important these days because what we're finding, what you're going to see, what you are seeing is that teams are smaller and they work in what are called more agile ways, meaning they don't take on large, large projects that have a long duration before a deliverable happens. They take on a long project, but they deliver that project in smaller increments along the way. All right, that happens a lot in any industry, especially in the technology industry. So small incremental improvements, or small increments they're called, are delivered more often versus one that takes a long time to deliver. Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. One is change happens along the way. So the environment never stays the same. The economy doesn't stay the same. People don't stay the same. Regulations don't stay the same. So the longer it takes for you to deliver any kind of product or service, the more at risk you are for your product or service not meeting the goal because things have changed along the way. Well, you need agile teams to be able to execute these small increments along the way. That's where that teamwork comes in and how, well, how it's so pivotal to, uh, to business these days and to, so pivotal, pivotal to the pivot. Um, again, working through, working through and with people. So that last, second to last bullet, thinking we, not I. And again, um, Smaller teams, moving faster, moving more agile, and as a we and not an I. All right, so that's, that's where the modern idea of teams is very, very effective. Um, 
And then creativity, obviously we can intersperse creativity and problem solving. Problem solving is probably, well, pro creativity and problem solving do kind of go together, but there's really one thing um, that, uh, the one point I want to make on this particular slide is you're typically, especially when you come into a skilled workforce, which you all, you all will come into a skilled workforce, you're being, you're being paid for your skills to be able to problem solve, right? So you're, you're being trained coming to university, learning a hard skill, and then understanding how to employ soft skills in order to, to uh, make those hard skills as effective as possible. And then the problem solving piece of that comes in when, hey, that's what you're there for. You're to, there to think, right? You're trained and, and educated to be able to think through problems. And, and again, pivot through the problem if you need to. Um, you're not given the answers, you have to find the answers. That's why it all relates together. So problem solving, you know, don't, don't let a problem become an obstacle. There's always ways around it. Problems are always opportunities. That's what, that's what most um, startups think. And that's what most startups believe. Problems are opportunities. And that's, you know, in any kind of business, that's what it is. Problems and opportunity. Because it, it always means there's some sort of solution that can be built around them. Um, and this one I really like a lot. This, this one is um, probably not really too much in the way I could throw out of this slide because the keys to problem solving and decision making, probably that first bullet is the most important part. Determine the root cause of the problem. What is the root cause? Um, why, um, so, why did, uh, why did this person slip and fall on the floor? Well, I don't know. Let's take a look. Well, the floor is wet. Well, why is the floor wet? Well, because the roof is leaking. Well, why is the roof leaking? Well, the roof is leaking because there, there's a hole in the, um, the joint between the, um, the roof and the gutter system. All right. Well, that's the root cause of the problem. All right. So getting to the root cause of the problem. Um, is, is key because that way you, you can't ask any more whys and you can't get uh, any further to, and when you fix the root cause, you typically take care of the problem. And that, that, that happens in every kind of situation. If you can learn that skill set, that's a very important skill set because then you fix the problem once and for all. Um, what else? Decide, determine what has to be decided, what direction you need to take in. Identify your options, choices, and alternatives. What information do you need? What information is needed? Actually, that bullet should probably be swapped with that third bullet. You need the information before you can identify any options. Right? Again, information. And then make a decision and be decisive. Okay? I, but the key to me, the key to this one really is that root cause. Right? If you're, if you're, if you're, um, if you're treating the symptom and not the root cause, the problem will exist. All right, and this gets in, that covers any organization. That's why information is so important. Um, ability to work under pressure, obviously. I'm not going to talk too much about that. We all know about that. If you've ever worked, you know that's going to happen at one point or another. And negotiations, um, conflict management. Obviously, the bottom here is to win go for a win-win um, solution if possible, and I'm not gonna go into all of those. Um, where does that kind of lead us? Well, um, an increase in service industry jobs emphasizes the need for soft skills. Soft skills are used in personal, in, in personal and, I should say professional. Huh, I should say professional and personal life. Right. Build on strengths, work on weaknesses, and understand yourself better and how to relate to others. That's sort of the, the next kind of why this, is, it, this slide deck is in here now, is because it's kind of set in, in your mind where we're going to go next with this Myers-Briggs indicators test, Myers-Briggs indicator test. Right. So this is sort of getting you thinking about some of those things that you know, you look at that slide deck and you're going, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that, I'm not good at this, I don't like to do that, I don't want this and I don't want that. Well, that's good, and you know that stuff. That's where the uh, Myers-Briggs indicators, um, personality indicators or indicator types come in 
And uh, so that's sort of setting the groundwork for that. That's where we'll head um, next week, I think, next week or the week after. And then there's a couple of Wikipedia. I don't even know why I have that on there. No one goes to Wikipedia anymore. Uh, any questions on that? I know it's kind of high level and nebulous, but the idea here is being able to wrap those soft skills around the hard skills. Some of those things we did talk about already, um, but it is kind of just sort of setting your mind up or opening your mind up to um, the whole Myers-Briggs. That's really what this is about. Uh, setting your mind up or opening your mind up to um, the Myers-Briggs personality indicators thing. Uh, tests to where you can kind of sort of look at things from a very objective perspective. That's kind of where uh, we're headed with that one. Okay. Questions on that? Not too hard, hopefully pretty self-explanatory. Um, like I said, next week when I talk about um, what's going to be on the exam, I don't know if there'll be too many questions from that on there. There'll be some concepts on there, um, but the will be specific. I don't think questions off of any of those slide decks. All right, a couple of points that I want to I want to try to get you out here around eight so that you can work on your project. Um, so let's take a quick look at the, of, of the text. The, where we're at in our process is chapters four and five of the text. That sort of aligns with where we're at in our process. You identified your topic, you've picked points that are going to help you support that topic and you're going to be able to write about it. Now we're at the beginning of the gather stage, finding resources that you're going to need in order to be able to write this thing. Um, and there's a few things that I want to highlight here. So this is, a, this is called the, 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 the pillar. So each one of these steps in the process has what the book calls as a pillar. All right, so it sort of holds up the topic of gather. So understanding or recognizing, knowing how to recognize um, the difference between the need to keep up to date. So in other words, understand, know, recognize, and then each one of those things is a bullet. And then be able to, and then each one of those is a bullet. Be able to use online and printed help. Um, and can find personal and expert help, identify what information is needed. So all the things that we've been talking about um, for knowing what information you need in order to be able to answer your question and to be able to find it. So I'm not gonna go over each one of those specifically. There are a few things that I wanna point out. We did talk a little bit last time about information formats from the internet. We talked, meaning we talked about raw data, that's a format. We talked about uh, visuals, that's a format. We talked about um, websites or web pages, that's a format. So the book in, in this section talks about formats. It talks about this um, idea of a web 2.0. And the idea of a, the term web 2.0 came about when we were able to mash content together. So it wasn't just a textual website or an audio uh, file. We were able to mix that stuff together. So if you ever hear that term, Web 2.0, it was being able to mash together all these different kinds of, now no one really talks, but if you hear the term, you'll know what it is. But no one really talks about it anymore because it's an assumption that we're able to do that. And all of our technology continues to get built out under that assumption that we have to continue to make that um, confluence or that uh, convert, um, what's the word? Uh, convergence of those different kinds of formats into one. So our web, our web pages are more um, filled with different kinds of uh, text and links and pictures and audio and video and whatever. Um, but it, it kind of sort of all started to come together with this web 2.0 thing where the web was at one point just text. Um, so you, again, you'll hear that term. Um, I'm not going to talk about any because you all know about these things, Twitters and blogs. 
uh, newspaper articles. I do want to talk about this one topic again, and we did we did cover it a little bit when we talked about evaluating the credibility of a source, and again, knowing what a primary source is. So this is a decent example of primary source. Um, just a, an example of, so another member of Harry's group recalled that he had two cousins, or had cousins in New York City who were experienced Superstorm super storm, storm Sandy firsthand. He offered to interview his cousins about their experiences during the storm. This type of information is known as primary information or source. Primary sources are accounts from a person or persons who have first-hand knowledge of an event. Speeches, photographs, diaries, autobiographies, and interviews are all primary sources. So again, knowing when you've got a primary source or when you've got a secondary source or even a tertiary source or even beyond that. Um, in your research, you may find that primary sources are going to be the ones that maybe were the first to gather the data, do the analysis, and present findings. Or primary sources are, uh, again, I'll go back to IEEE example. They are the ones that wrote the standards for a lot of the technology we use. Well, they're primary sources. Okay, so examples of primary sources. Again, so you'll know whether or not your source is a primary source or not. And then scholarly journal articles, we know, uh, we've talked about it, um, scholarly journal, Journal articles are the ones that typically are peer reviewed. We've talked about that it being one of them. However, there are other good sources that can substitute as um, peer reviewed journals as well. Okay, so scholarly, again, the word scholarly here typically means that there's an abstract at the beginning of the article. An abstract summarizes its contents. In an abstract, key points as well as conclusions are briefly described. Abstracts are often included in a database record. So when you do the search on the database, you typically find the abstract. That way you know if that source is good for you or not or will get you what you need. And researchers find this information helpful when deciding, and again, just like we talked about tonight, researcher, Find this information helpful when deciding whether or not to retrieve the article, whether or not it's actually even worth going and looking at the content, all right, and following our, our process. Um, let's see, let's skip that. Let's skip that. And then citations, again, what is important is that we cite works that we've used that have um, been done by uh, prior authors. Even, even Wikipedia contains references. These consist of citations to resources that authors have quoted or paraphrased in their work or have used in research. So citations can be confusing. That's why we have tools like Citation Fox. It really doesn't matter much, quite honestly, to me, but we gotta pick, you gotta pick a side, um, whether it's APA or MLA, quite honestly, I don't understand really why we have all these different ones. Just give the, give the source the credit they're due, recognize them and cite them, and just call it a day. You don't need to have all these different formats, but um, it's there. And, and the fact that um, you know, we know we need to do it, and we've got an easy tool in Citation Fox to help us. We're not going to get it, and I, I'll never, <laughs> I'll never test you on all the components of an AM, APA or an MLA. But honestly, again, like I said, don't memorize something that you can look up. Just know that there is a format, and there is a reason, uh, or there is a particular format for that versus uh, an MLA. They, they use, um, yeah, so they do it in a different order. You know, again, the point is you, you're citing the article. Um, well, we've got Citation Fox. I'm not going to quiz that. Uh, and then evaluation. So the, 
the evaluation, again, the, the book does a pretty decent job of talking about evaluation, evaluating all of the sources that you found, what's good and what is not good. Um, so in this particular example, I'm just gonna jump to that second paragraph. Further investigation into the book revealed that although the author had written textbooks in various on a variety of subjects, she was not a trained historian. The research she had done to write our Virginia and in particular, the information she included about black Confederate soldiers was done through the internet and includes sources created by groups like the Sonoms of Confederate Veterans, an organization which promotes views of history that de-emphasize the role of slavery in the Civil War. Right? So again, the point of that being the source of that or, or the author there, what was the credentials of that author? Did that author cite any of that work? So that, that's the example that this, this particular book is using. Um, so they, so, so the, evalu the evaluate pillar and states that information or that individuals are able to re review the research process and compare and evaluate information and data. It encompasses important knowledge and abilities. So somebody that understands this, understands the information and data landscape in their learning research, issues of quality, accuracy, relevance, bias, reputation, and credibility relating to the information data sources. All right. So they're able to do all of these things, and I'm not going to read all the bullets. You can definitely do it. But again, it, it puts into context your understanding and your knowing that you need to understand how to evaluate sources. So Again, this book does a pretty decent job of, um, of doing it. And again, you see the word critically used a lot in there. Um, di so distinguish between the different information resources and information they provide, choose suitable material, assess the quality, accuracy, relevancy, bias, reputation, and credibility, assess the credibility of the data, read critically, identifying key points, um, relate the information found, critically appraise and evaluate their findings and those of others. Again, that gets back to the idea of triangulating. Okay. Critically appraise and evaluate the findings of their own. Again, there's the evaluate section. And obviously, how to evaluate each of these different kinds. So this gives you an overview, and I'm not going to read through all of this. In choosing your material, what do you use? Gauging whether the source relates to your topic um, at all is probably one of those. How high up it appears on the results list when you search may be another. Beyond that, you may base your decision at least partly on how easy it is to access. All of those are important criteria to varying degrees, but there are other criteria you want to keep in mind when deciding if a source will be useful for your research. Again, quality. Accuracy, relevance, bias, and in reputation, that gets that gets sort of uh, that goes kind of along with um, with credibility, okay? And who, who's writing it, and what kind of reputation does this person have? Credibility, trustworthiness of data. And then any references that your research has built itself upon in order to be able to, um, to make its point. And then evaluating your findings. Now here's a good one right here. So knowing when to stop. For some researchers, the process of searching for and evaluating resources is a highly enjoyable, rewarding, and part of doing research. Granted, you've got probably four other classes, other than this one, plenty of other work in those. So you're gonna not, you're gonna need to make that decision. When do I stop looking for this stuff? I was told I had to do four. Is four good enough? Well, based on the four quality sources that I found, four is good enough. I mean, that's kind of the decision process you want to go through. For others, it's, uh, it's a necessary evil on the way to constructing your own ideas and sharing your own conclusions. Whichever end of the spectrum you most closely identify with, here are a few ideas about the ever-important skill of knowing when to stop. 
Right. So you, you satisfied your requirements for the assignment. Right. You already know what those requirements are. All right, so four good, good quality uh, sources. Preferably one of them peer reviewed, but if not peer reviewed, one of those respected journals that um, will actually get you there. Right, again, having a deadline. Well, the reason why we do it this way is we start at the very beginning of the semester and we work our way step by step through this thing to the point where we're going to get into the um, halfway point of the semester and we switch away from focusing on the research paper and we start talking about data. Well, that period of time is the time you have like eight weeks, seven weeks to then slowly construct that paper. So if you do it in a way that you're doing, you know, pieces at a time or at least chunks at a time, pulling the whole thing together at the end is pretty easy versus waiting. And there's no way that, you know, you want to do that. So that's why I we work from the beginning so that you know what's in front of you. It won't be hard. Again, the point of it's not to, to torture you um, to write a paper for each 10 pages. It's for you to learn a good process and get good habits for when you need to do it again, it becomes less, um, it becomes easier to do. And that's the reason why we do this early on or early-ish on in the in informatics program so that it's easy for you then later on to, um, to do a big project like this, you know how to do it. Hopefully you're not gonna be halfway through and doing that. Again, that's one of the other reasons why we do the um, assignment in, in phases, do this big thing in phases such that you're now getting to the point where you're gonna be looking for, for sources. So that'll be the time where you're gonna decide if you need to change your topic or not, all right? Not at week 14 but now, so hopefully you won't have to, um, but again, if you need to, you'll know when you start looking for material, if you've got it or, or you can't find it. Right. And you're not gonna get overwhelmed because you got a good process, so don't worry about that. Um, theory to practice, right, I can talk about all, <laughs> I can talk about this all I want, but unless you actually do it, um, you know, it's like anything, unless you really actually do it, you're not gonna know how to do it. You're not gonna get good at it, so. All right, everything else I've been talking about is in here. All right, good. All right, any questions on that? Again, I, the text is pretty good. Um, we've talked a lot about this along the way and um, Getting to the point now where I think you're, you're 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 at least seeing how the process works, and you're going to um, we're not too far away. We're actually only a couple of assignments away from really kind of just sort of letting it, you know, you then having time to work on it to get it done by the end end of the semester, and then you'll have time tonight too to um, to get your pieces done. Uh, Eleven fifty nine. And for the um, outline next week. So hopefully you've been at least thinking about sources. Again, my suggestion, so a source, your, your sources list is due for a week from tonight by 11.59. My suggestion is to gather more than four because you can throw them out later on. Um, And if you can, again, I, I, I would prefer that you choose so, so that when you find some resources, put them in, make yourself do the a, APA format on those now so that you're not struggling to do it later on. So you'll submit that next week in good format in, in the right submission section, or you'll submit it as a Word document. Questions before we wrap? All right, correct. Your, your, your sources only, I would like to see you have them in APA format, just to think about them, but yeah, you don't have to annotate the bibliographies or any of that kind of stuff. Just know what it is you're gonna be looking at 
because then you'll spend, after your resources have been found, you'll spend time getting that information and reading through the good stuff and you'll, you'll have, you know, at, literally at the end of the next assignment, which is on the ninth, the, at that point you'll have all the raw materials and it'll be, you'll have pretty much the rest of the semester just to kind of figure out what you're going to use from. That makes sense? Okay, cool. All right, so I will see you uh, again next week.
Thank you too.